I'd like you to turn to the person beside you. Can you do this, please? Shake him by the hand and say, you're absolutely wonderful today. Can you do that? Wow, here we are in the Rock Church, and uh, it's good. Now, if I'm a little bit fuzzy in my mind, it's because yesterday I came back from Malaysia, and I about 7.25 in the morning, and then I went to bed, and I because my wife happened to be out, she usually wakes me up about midday, and I slept till about half past two, it's evident I needed it, and then I went to bed, I was tired, I went to bed, I shouldn't have, I went to bed about nine o'clock, but two o'clock this morning, I'm sending emails to everyone and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I've travelled extensively over the many years and I, you know, I was a good boy when I was travelling in earlier years. I used to go to India for one weekend, you know, start off, you know, after the meeting, say, Sunday morning leave, and then get back for the next weekend and I'd come back on Sunday morning and I'd be almost dyslexic. And uh, they never appreciated it. I used to get so upset because I did it all for them. <coughs> and usually when I, um, um, you know, got a bit of jet lag, I get things back to front. Uh, this morning I left my motor of my car running outside. I've got a, a McGain, you know, a, um, uh, what do they call the blooming thing? I forget the name. You see even that? Uh, a Renault. And you've got to sort of press your foot on the, <coughs> on the uh, brake and then press the button and that's, you know, it stops. And I, anyway, anyway. Sometimes in jet lag, you know, I get things mixed up. <laughs> Every now and again, I get the, the hairspray, I put it under my arms, <laughs> and the deodorant on my hairspray. <laughs> so uh, there we are. So it's good to be here. I spoke to your pastor last night. I don't normally have my uh, iPad on. I have it in my office, but because I was a bit tired and I wanted to check some mail, I took, I happened to take my iPad and just, I was in a bit of a lazy seat and I pressed it on. No sooner I pressed on, here is Pastor Eugene on Viber. So I spoke to him, he was in Budapest and going, uh, his wife had just arrived, she's very tired, Judy, and, uh, and then he emailed me and said, pass his, their love on to you. So there we are, I've been a good boy, <coughs> so there we are. Now, I've been ministering over 50 years. I've been married to the same wife, Joan, at the back there for 52 years, is that right, love? 52 years. Now, you say that is absolutely impossibility. He looks so young. <laughs> now, the reason being, I found a secret in the Bible for looking young. Do you want it? Do you want it? <laughs> Paul the Apostle said, I die daily. <laughs> so there we are. About once a month, something happens around my hair and I paint every white hair out possible. <laughs> and that's the reason for looking young. I've just uh, spoken a full-on family camp about three hours away from Kuala Lumpur. It is hot as hell over there, trust me. And anyway, uh, for C3, one of Phil Pringle's church. And there's a lot of good things happening. I've spent 40 years of my life in Asia and uh, <clears throat> next weekend, Joan and I go to uh, Tasmania and I'm speaking on four coping with grief and crisis seminars in, in, in each place with the Scripture Union. And it's a four-hour seminar. And someone got my books and they've been chasing me since last February. And I'm doing all the, the entire uh, uh, Tasmania, their um, uh, chaplains and so on. And also be a non-church, you know, generic market, which I have. Now, would you believe this is not the only subject I preach? Believe me. In fact, I didn't even know that I was speaking on this until I was overseas and I opened an email and I sort of forgot about it. 
And then uh, Eugene said, well, you're speaking on that. And I went into the office this morning and I saw you'd advertised it. So I thought I'd better be a good boy and obey the pastor. I have a message to speak on, but I've been speaking uh, um, in, in different churches. I come back, uh, I don't know if I'm Arthur or Martha sometimes. I come back, I'm, I'm away on Sunday, next Sunday. I come back the following Sunday I preach three messages in a meetings in a church just over the border. Get up early, four o'clock in the morning, and then I'm going to speak at a pastor's conference, leadership conference in Vanuatu. Come back for three days, and then I'm back into Asia for a little over a month. And then I come back, and then I'm back up to Indonesia for three weeks. So uh, my life is pretty busy. I gave over my church two and a half years ago, and people say... Um, How's retirement? <laughs> I am busy, trust me. Anyone want to volunteer as a secretary, see me afterwards, you will be a gift from heaven. Amen. Anyone that follow me around the world as an IT person, you'll go to heaven. <laughs> my, my iPad uh, broke up, or you know, I'm going to buy a new one. And even then, I, this is a surface, by the way, and I've never used this to preach. This way, so this is new. All right, I better settle down. And I suppose I have to speak on seven tips on facing a crisis. Um, first of all, how many feel tired today? Anyone sleepy? Okay, now please don't go to sleep because I've got the gift of waking up people. Is that okay? Yes. Is that the deal? Yes. Reminds me of the time when this preacher. Preachers do not like people going to sleep. And anyway, especially while they preach. And this guy uh, started to nod off and finally he, he, he nodded off. And the preacher got irritable and he raised his voice through the microphone trying to wake this man up. And then he got exasperated, so he banged the pulpit thinking the reverberation would wake the man up. And in an indignant way, the man would not, uh, you know, the man wouldn't wake up. In an indignant way, the preacher turns to one of the elders and he says, wake up that man. And the elder said, no, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> so maybe it's up to me. I want to just uh, turn. Now, listen, dear friends, you know this. There's a great debate in the body of Christ, either verbal or non-spoken whether we should preach from our Bibles, whether we should preach from our iPads, whether we should preach from our phones. I was in a church uh, last year on the Gold Coast and I had a Sunday night off and I snuck in there, places full, and I said to the young pastor, I said, man, I couldn't even read my Bible. He said, the, you know, it was so dark. He said, who brings a Bible to church anymore? It's all on iPads and their phones and so on. So I'm not against that, but uh, I do believe the Bible says this. It says, Jesus said, a certain householder brings from his treasure house old things, that's the Bible, and new things. So I want to meet two markets. Young people, you know, IT frustrates me. You know, I really do want to get abreast to it. I just master uh, well, some program, Windows 8. Anyone got Windows 8? I'm sure it's from, the, from hell. But uh, you, you're nodding your head. You know what I'm talking about. And you just master something and then they bring a new, you know, you download. I don't want to download because I'm used to the one and I've just got that master. They download and they change it all around. But I tell you what, at least it expands your mind. If you do have a Bible, friends, I want you to turn with me, please, to Psalms. Oh, that's a big Bible, brother. That really is a big Bible. And let me just get this here. And uh, I'm a little bit husky. It's because I've been preaching uh, overseas. Oh, dear. Yep, it's opening. Psalm, now the, I, this is in the Bible, too. I could actually give that to you, but I just thought I'd take it off the screen here. Psalm 77. Come on, move, move. Anyone been to Indonesia? The, the word for hurry is chapat, 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 chapat. Hurry, hurry. And this thing 
just seems to have its own mind today. It's coming. Here it is. All right. While I was staying in London some years ago in a hotel, I woke up in the middle of the night and I felt compelled to read a psalm. And as a result, I wrote a chapter for one of my books. Psalm 77, 1 to 10. If you have your Bibles, iPads, your phone uh, open, that's good. It says, I cried to God, out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave me ear to me. The day of my trouble, he gave ear to me. The day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in night, in the night without ceasing. My soul refuses to be comforted. I remembered God and was and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed, Selah. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I considered the days of old, the ancient of the times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate with my heart and my spirit makes diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favourable no more? Has his mercy ceased? Um, uh, has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forever? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? And I said, this is my anguish. But I remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I want to very quickly, and this is not what I'm speaking on the seven tips of survivor crisis. Remember, what I normally do is a four full hour seminar and there's a lot of material. I've had registered, I have a four hour seminar re registered. I've had over 50,000 people registered for a four hour seminar. Well over 100,000, over 100. Uh, in fact, um, when I was in uh, a composite, a thousand people in, uh, in London, in a black church, a sophisticated black church there. And this has gone off. No, it hasn't. All right, so uh, 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 there's so much, but I just want to lay a foundation. And the first phase that I want to just mention here without PowerPoint is my soul refuses to be comforted. Now, whether we like it or not, folk, every person, the sound of my voice, is going to be hit emotionally, spiritually, physically. Uh, whether we like it or not, that death, crisis, uncertainty is universal. It's part and parcel, sadly, of the deal of life. There is so much pressure on society. I asked a medical uh, doctor just very recently was taking me from A to B by car and I said, what is the number one problem that you're dealing with? He said, anxiety. The World Health Organization believed that by the year 2030, the number one problem worldwide will be depression. I've got an embryonic uh, template on a book called Depression, the Common Cold Out of the Mind. Of the mind. One out of five uh, Australians suffer depression. And so, whether we like it or not, we need to have what I call manageable, workable keys to help yourself, your siblings, and help your friends during the time of crisis. I'm going to say a lot, time is a premium, just going to throw some one-liners out. You can realise the frustration to talk about such a subject in a very, very small lot of time for the subject. But I talk about, you know, stomping through the garden of people's emotions, putting a conspiracy of silence, you see, over people's pain. Did you know that here in Australia, every four hours, someone's committing suicide? And uh, it's not going to go away. Our mental health bill is in the billions. And most people, I'll guarantee if I went through this group today, someone is on some, depended on some medication uh, to keep you alive, not only physically, but emotionally. And whether we like it or not, there are some things that we need to tackle. We need to ask the questions and not go into, like the ostrich, uh, into denial. 
And I believe this, that the reason I'm talking like this is because I, my wife and I have been through loss. We, we're pioneering our first church in Invercargill, New Zealand, still there. Great church, six acres, buildings. That's been my life. A great visionary by the grace of God. And then our four and a half months, baby, beautiful baby daughter, she passed away, came across here from Invercargill and been now pastoring that church, given it over 30 years, started in the school with 22 people now. And the whole thing is emerged with land and we've just bought another 50 acres and we're doing another school right now, 7 million bucks being spent this year, be open beginning of next year. And now looking at doing something else, international colleges and community supports and 350 staff, all that sort of stuff. I know I've been a visionary, but in the midst of all that, you know, if you had said to me, uh, talk about grief, I would have thought that grief is something sinister, it's something for weak people. In fact, of all the many years when I pastored, I never once approached the subject of grief because as I said, grief is only for those who are falling apart, haven't got it together, uh, really need a good kick up the behind, sorry for the crudeness, but they need to get life. But something happened together, something happened in my life that changed that. I was away back over in New Zealand doing eight meetings and doing a church back in those days where you had meetings one, two, three, five or six nights uh, uh, every night, all that sort of stuff. Beautiful 24 and a half year old daughter, Janine, a uh, lovely girl, fit, had two wisdom teeth out on the Gold Coast. She's travelled, she was a professional ballerina, been in stages uh, in different parts of the world, all that sort of stuff. She was fit and she had two wisdom teeth out and she had a stomach viral thing as well, and it was like a double whammy, and she passed it. They became toxic, and she passed away in eight days. It broke my heart, broke my wife's heart, and the sad part about it, the church wasn't there to help. I've done radio link-up, 30 link-up. I've been on TV through UK, uh, over in New Zealand, here, and they've asked me invariably, was the church there for you? Now, I'm a pastor. I've got it together, I'm, the, I'm faith personified, you know, faith person, visionary, and I had to say, no, it's not. And I want to tell you this, dear friends, the church has got to get, we talk a language, but some of us don't perform. I had to go outside the church to get help. That made me so angry. And I began to delve and research and turn every book inside out and upside down and uh, to research on the subject, so I help. Now, I could stand here, help those that are suffering. I could stand here for hours, and don't worry, I won't. And, because uh, I've got another meeting this afternoon. But the thing is this, uh, and talk about the subject. And yet, it's 22 years today that our lovely daughter passed on. Joan reminded me this morning. And yet, it's as fresh as it was happened yesterday. I preach on motivation things. I, I was going to say, I've got a message called uh, generosity. Pa I've been sought after to preach that. One pastor hears about it. They say, will you preach it? When I come back from um, Tasmania, I'm on the uh, and Tweed preaching their, their services on generosity. I preach it that many times. Motivation and all that, I'm a, a strong motivational person, trust me. I could preach on faith and I'll guarantee you, you'll feel faith and you don't get invited into planes and ministry. If you, you know, they don't do it just for the colour of your eyes. I have a touch and, and I know I can move prophetically and do by the grace of God. God has given me gifts as he's given you gifts but I've said all that to say, not because that I'm the best thing on the block, but when it comes to grief and crisis, I'm passionate to help people because you will go through it, whether you like it or not. I see faith people, strong people, come apart at the seams who are unprepared. And I want to say this, friends, the greatest means of evangelism 
is when someone is traumatized, lose their job, lose their partner, lose their, li- their, their limbs, or lose uh, their opportunity, or lose, uh, you know, whatever it is. I talk about the different faces of grief. If you're there at the right time, with the right word, with a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, a little help, that is gold. The church has to be taught how to bridge the gap in a person's crisis. In fact, the research tells us that people, when they go through a crisis, are more vulnerable or more open to receive Christianity. But the sad part, most of us run away from it because we don't understand what grief's all about. We think it's sinister. Grief is an ally, you know, and it's throughout the psalm. So let's just quickly have a look at this and this thing's gone off the boil again. No, so my soul refuses to be comforted. So in the initial acute phase of grief or crisis, the sufferer's locked into pain that feels unbearable. Any comfort seems to be a little assistance. Nothing anyone says or does seems to help. Hence, my soul refuses to be comforted. Now, that happens in the initial phases of grief. I remembered God and was troubled. Rather than bringing comfort and relief, it seems to accentuate the pain like salt being uh, rubbed into the wound. My spirit's overwhelmed. The mind searches for answers among the rubble of disappointment. This is very much the experience of someone who's been traumatised. The more the mind searches for answers, the more the heart weakens. You hold my eyelids open. The griever finds it very hard to sleep. The mind is a mass of thoughts and questions and confusion that cause us restless, and there will be many sleepless nights. I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. The eternal pain and shock numbs the heart, and the pain of loss is so unbearable that one cannot find words to express the incredible conflict raging from calm to hysteria that rages on the inside. I considered the days of old. You know, people come along and they say, just remember, remember, get your Bible. You know, that can be like salt in the wound. The mind has its own timetable. It's normal for someone impacted by grief to reflect back on the loss and remember former days. I had a cappuccino with a man who was 60 years of age yesterday, had a business in the IT. The whole thing's collapsed. He's been out of a job for two years. His world is upside down. In fact, in the initial phase of grief, every waking moment is taken up with thoughts about the loss. The years of the ancient times, the mind throws up memories from long ago, memories previously gone from the mind. It's normal to fantasize. How do we know what we had wasn't 100%, but when we lose it, there's a, there's a tendency to fantasize in our memory. And then I call to remember my song in the night. In an attempt to grasp some form of comfort, the mind tries to relieve the sweet moments, but to little avail. I meditate within my heart and my spirit makes diligent search. In the depths of our entire being, there's a tremendous longing and searching for answers. The question will be, why, why, why? I mean, sometimes I say, why is it that my wife and I left, I was managing a business, had my first house, I've always been a bit of a goer when I was 19 years of age, and we left Christchurch to go and carve out a church, had a son and our first daughter uh, died. Why, why, why? Will the Lord cast off forever? After loss and a state of shock, the griever may feel Incredibly isolated, numb and suffering from rejection. For goodness sake, don't go up with a happy clappy. You'll be right, mate. You'll be right. And some Christians, I'm a little bit sarcastic here today, but some Christians need to put their brain in gear before they think. You know, one of my key verses is in Ezekiel 3 verse 15. I sat where they sat. I'm writing a book on called Coming Apart at the Screams on Suicide. And you know, I've done case studies and I've got a little there and I sit down with people. I say, what was it like? And I enter into their world. Folk, it's terrible. This first book, or this is my, I wrote the second one. And the first point, a hundred do's and don'ts for the griever. 
And my very first, uh, it's edited, it's forwarded by Alan Myers, by the way. The very first point on the do's and don'ts for the griever is do be kind to yourself. Man, I th- if only someone had a come up to me and said, Kinder, just take it easy, be kind to you. That would have been like hearing from heaven. I'm a pastor, Pentecostal, prophesy over people, believe in miracles. And where's my God? And then you get the faith people that say, well, the reason that your, your daughter died is because you didn't operate in faith. Some of those people, are, are no, the past is no longer in the ministry today. It's all interesting, isn't it? You see, it's uncommon for the griever to feel that God's angry with them and they've come under his judgment and we have to be kind to help people through that. And then the psalmist said, and will, will he be favourable no more? You know, when you get hit, you lose your job, you lose, your kid runs away with some, um, in some sexual fantasy and hurts you and your faith system is, is all up, up and down and upside down and your idealism is shot and your kid's pumping drugs or si- your siblings and, you know, you're in your house and they've got daughters and sons. Hey, this is a real life. And, you know... It feels as though, you know, some are being blessed, but I'm going through this hell. And it seems as though others seem to enjoy so much blessing. The griever feels unloved and emotionally rejected, like Job searching for God. Oh, that I knew where I might find him. I present my case before him. Others may appear to be exempt from problems. You know, I know stacks and stacks and stacks of preachers who never lose, and most people, thank God, never lose a sibling, never lose a child, never lose, you know, and yet we got one, two, you know, things happen. Why? And so, and uh, it's hard to believe that God will ever show his love. You know, for two or three years, I felt, well, you know, I faked my emotions, came through, went through, hallelujah, but my heart wasn't there, I was numb. I, I move in the spirit and, and it's a forte and pick out people in the word of knowledge and, and, yeah, and that went from me for about two solid years. I lost confidence. But I want to tell you this, it does come back by the grace of God. You see, I felt so lost. I felt I'd never be normal again. I lost all confidence and operating the gifts of the spirit. Has his anger shut up his tender mercy? The soul, the mind, and the will feels awkward and confused. It's locked into guilt, recriminations, and rejection, feeling void of the compassion and worth of the Holy Spirit. For a time, I thought hardness, being unable to sense God's compassion. Then I thought to appeal the years of the right hand of God. This represents God's ability to respond with powerful acts. And as you persevere in your mind, consoling yourself and allowing the Holy Spirit to bring comfort, you will find that help does come. Can I say this, dear friends? Grief distorts our perception of God. The psalmist questions, why the distortion? Why the cutting off? Why the blocking of the soul? Why can't I express myself? Then he realised there was his grief and his emotions that were distorting his image of the character of God. God has not changed. As Malachi says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Grief is being like, likened to being on a roller coaster in the dark. It changes our perspective of every day. Life, our focus is very much affected by, power, uh, by our pain. And finally, Psalm 73, uh, 2, 21 to 22. Thus my heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and I was ignorant like a beast. And then in Psalm, I believe, therefore I spoke. Now, I've just raced through that and I will quickly race through the seven tips to survive a crisis. I want you to flick this so I've got it here somewhere, haven't I? Is this on, brother? What do I do? Oh, amazing. It works. Now, very quickly, and forgive me for racing, but I want to encourage you to get some workable knowledge to help people. Unemployment tears a person apart. Sudden losses. You know, I passed it long enough to know there's hardly a week goes by there's not something major happening in human lives. Folk, we can't just, you know, go jumping through the tulips. The guy in the street, the guy that you work with needs help. 
And I believe this, we need to learn to walk slowly through people. I get emails, phone calls all the time. People, hey, the reason I'm doing four seminars in Tasmania, someone got a hold of my book. All right, now let's have a look at this. In uh, the word, how do I put this pointer on? The right one? Oh, mate. Okay, defining crisis. The word crisis can be defined as follows, turning point or decisive moment, especially in the honest time of acute uh, suspense, dilemma, cl climax, crux, emergency point. I apologise for moving fast. All right. Did you know this, that in the Chinese vernacular, the, the, the culture, the word crisis means both danger and opportunity. Folk, we've heard this, there's a silver lining to every cloud. And in a time of crisis, if you process it, it takes time to process it, positive things can be born as a result of a crisis. In this book, I tell a story how that I was over in Indonesia and I had an idea of bringing a, a, a plane load of pastors and leaders to the Gold Coast. Never been done before for a 12 or 30 day conference for the three anointings, that's tourism, shopping, and the word. <laughs> and we paid a company, true story here, uh, we traded a company, I put $20,000 $20, down or straight after Christmas, and we were, they, they were going to do homestay. Well, within about 12 days for the conference, I got a, a, a fax back in those days, they're pulling out of the contract. Talk about depression. Man, I didn't want to go. I pulled the blankets over my head and I went to God that I died. We tried. We phoned, we phoned, we phoned, tried to get a, a tents, tried to get straight after Christmas. Everything was chock-a-block. Tried to get blankets, tried to get this, tried to get tents. Every door closed and I was getting depressed by the moment. Into my office came a young man who'd been in uh, some form of uh, tourism he said, you let me have a God. I, said, I remember saying it's an impossibility. And he had an entrepreneurial edge. He said, you let me know, go. And I opened the, opened the, the, the bulletin. Want to make $360 after Christmas or, so, or whenever it was. The phones rang off the hook. Cut a long story short, we worked 24-7. And we had hundreds of delegates come. And there's only one family of the entire hundreds that came we're, uh, we're a non-Christian family. We were out there seeing where they drink and dogs and cats and all that. And, I, and you know, it was, and, and it wasn't until the conference started and I was speaking, I said, I told the conference what had happened. And at a time of crisis, we opened up and I gave that young man a $10,000 budget. And I said, I want you to open a college, what you come from, true story. And uh, without eldership approval, they came back from their holidays and they wanted to sack me. One elder left the church and we were in a crisis. But you know, folk, we, we then, as Barry and some of you know, we, we, the International College, it owns multi-millions of dollars of building. If you're ever in Burley Junction, that, uh, that building there, uh, anyway, it's, it's owned by the International College. And hundreds, thousands of adult students uh, uh, went through, about 11, 1,200 people. And it came, it started with about nine students, no money, but it became a reality. It was in a time of crisis. And I want to tell you this, dear friends, if you hang in there, crisis does have a silver lining. The next one is seven tips to survive a crisis. Number one, face reality. Now, the Christian church, not this church, the church down the road, <laughs> are renowned for denial. Did you know that your faith can actually be a point of denial? Some people won't go to doctors. You know why? It's not because they've got faith. They're afraid. And I'm a great believer. Face your problem. You know, Jehoshaphat, God said to Jehoshaphat, he said, uh, he said, we have no might against, uh, Jehoshaphat said as he prays to the Lord, he says, we have no might against this great, great company that cometh up to battle against us. But he didn't put the full stop there. He said, but our eyes are upon you. Folk, face your, if you're broke or you're going break, 
you know, a lot of businesses, I know it, I've counseled, and I see them, they should close the doors, and they hang on, they hang on, they hang on, they hang on, and they bleed, and they believe, oh, they've got a word from God. There comes a time when you've got to face the reality of your problem. Face it. If you're sick, get help. If you're in depression all the time, get help. You know, this is a key, and I can't speak long on this, but face the reality. Be a realist. Anyone like to say amen? Amen. Be real. Number two, do something. Action's needed. You know, the younger people today, when I started pastoring years ago, Barry and so on, we had nothing. We were given a Bible, a few lectures, and said, go make it happen. But there is, gee, on Google, you got everything there. You don't have to suffer alone. Amen? May I give you a suggestion? If you've got some pains and aches and pains, don't go on Google at midnight and, and try to find out why, because you find, you know, you've got, you're going to die with, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. All right, do something. Action's needed. Faith is action. Can anyone say I'm into that? Avoid the blame syndrome. You know, we live in a society of blame. I'm like this because mum. I'm like that because dad. I'm like that because my husband, my father. I'm like this because the pastor. I'm like this because my boss. Sir, faith does not blame. Faith moves ahead. I'm going over to speak at a church in Malaysia. They've asked me, and I got a message called Seven Keys to the Commission Factor. Good thought. And have you ever seen this before? The... And they stood, the 11 stood on a mountain, not 12, 11. They had to process failure. One of their guys they did life with, let him down, and he was a thief, a liar, and he betrayed them. But my next point is, and this is what I'm alluding to, the second point is faith always looks forward. They never stayed back and blamed Judas. And oh, that's the reason we're like this and nothing's going to happen. They processed their disappointment, but faith always looks forward. And then Jesus said, go. And that's the third key. If you want to know the other keys, come to Malaysia. (laughs) All right, do something. Avoid the blame syndrome. Listen, you know, blaming, it's like being in a wheelchair. It gives you something to do but you don't go anywhere. Let's have a blame time. Do you know in the Bible, when the Lord came into the garden, what happened? Adam blames the woman. The woman blames the serpent. Everybody's blaming everyone else. But I want to tell you this, folk, when you get hit, no good saying the government this, that, you have to process your disappointment and appropriate with God, with people, and move forward. Can anyone say I'm into that? All right, the third one, the fourth one is ask for help. Ask for help. You know, there are people in the church, friends, relatives, that can help you. You know, pride doesn't help ask for help. And sometimes, dear friend, the only thing that stops us from from getting through it is is our pride. We've got to swallow our pride and say, look, uh, you know, I've got some problems. I need help. Would you help me? And and, and there's an abundance of help. Don't suffer alone. Please don't do it. It's not worth it. Okay, number five is cut your losses. This is back to, to, uh, you know, uh, denial. I, I was over in uh, Malaysia. They, they asked me to go over uh, and there's a group of businessmen. I did a half-day seminar and they gave me the subject on making a right turn in the downturn. You know the GFC? Making a right turn in the downturn. And I did a little research and I came up through the corporate world with the three Cs. Cut. You know, even to make that decision, we've got to Cut. Cut our budget, cut our staff, all that sort of stuff. That's a, that's a step forward. Two, do it carefully. And number three, do it creatively. And you know what's happening? The Newman government, because I've had to cut, cut, cut. These are tough times. 
Our government, our federal government, you know that, it's not a walk in the park anymore. We've had two decades of scooping the pro, the, all the proceeds and the goodies from our mining industry. That's gone. So we're in that phase of what can we do? How can we reinvent ourselves? All that. Hey, we're part of it. You're part of this. I know about, uh, you know, having to cut staff and, you know, being the bad boy on the block. Man, you know, I'm a pastor and, you know, if I ever started again, which I won't, this, you know, I wouldn't do buildings for me. I've had all that. But I'd never let the pastor be the CEO. That's a job for someone else. And I've been the CEO chairman for years because people want a pastor. And I'd have to go and put some bleed out, put people off staff, haven't got the money over the years and all that. And they come in and they see that man of God who can't meet my needs. <clears throat> I believe the man of God should be the man of God. I believe the past, you know what? Our churches are screaming out for pastors. Anyone like to say amen? And we've got, we've got uh, CEOs running this and the corporate side of the church. I want to tell you, it's got so many holes in it. I mean, you can't go, I'm not talking about, no, nothing about this church. I'm sure they're great pastors. You try to ring, you try to ring some pastors and, and tell, they, they, have, they can't get back to you. They're so blooming busy. But I believe that people need to be shepherded. I mean, I make this statement, I used to make it, if I'm sick in your church and someone from that church doesn't come and visit me, I wouldn't go back to that church again. Talk to me. Jesus was a shepherd. That's your job, reaching out to people. Can anyone say amen? You know, sometimes people say, oh, yeah, young people say, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm bored. Well, if you're bored, get out and visit someone. A couple of weeks ago, my wife, I preached at a church and my wife and I, we went to see someone in a hospital and I thought, mate, you could do a full time just saying, how you going? How you going? How you going? People are lonely. You go for a walk. I go for a power walk, have for a while, I got a gammy back. But the point is this, oh, how you doing? People want to talk to you. You know, how to build a church, just get people talking to people. Amen? Spend some time. What would happen if this church, if you put one night aside or a portion of your Saturday aside just for someone outside of your circle? Phone them up, coffee. You know what would happen? They'd become a new buzz in the house. Amen? And, you know, God gave us mobile phones so we could text. I passed to my church by texting. Texting. I'm in. Are you okay? Still love me? Practical. We're so blooming busy. Not you, the church down the road I'm talking about now. We're like the, the scribe and the Pharisee. We're so blooming busy, we don't see a guy's wounded. He's screaming out, he's, he's bloodied, and, and we just, we're too caught in our, what we're doing. But I want to tell you what the greatest means of evangelism, how do we get cut ALSs? <laughs> this is the preacher of me. The greatest means of evangelism for people with people. Amen. Did you know the cafes, the coffee ship, the shops of the world are the greatest means of evangelism? Did you know this, that during the French Revolution, that the French or private, the French actually banned the cafes? And then because of the hue and cry of the public, they had to open them up because they believed they were conspiring against the government. Oh, the greatest means of, of being connected. Take your list. Pray over people. Look, folk, it's, the, the Christian life's supposed to be exciting. You know, uh, you don't know this, but I've told you I've got the stupid back that's killing me at the moment. And when I travel, one thing I don't like, and I'm not rich like some of you, where, you know, you, you, I, I do my washing and ironing at hotels and, and, you know, I don't let the hotel do it all the time because it's too expensive. And I have to iron, and my wife knows, everyone knows I hate ironing. So I, I get this back and I get irritable. You know, w once in the rare time when I get irritable. <laughs> you know why that, that's not right. I'm one of these guys, you know, pastor preachers, has an altar call. 
And I go up, he says, Kinder, what will, I, what will I pray for? He says, I say, Pastor, I want patience, but I want it now. <laughs> and so I, I, I'm, I'm ironing, my back's agitating, I get irritable. And then I was over in Malaysia, and a pastor's wife says, why don't you sit down? And I thought, why does mugging me think of that? So I sit on the bed now, and I iron. But here's the point. Every time... I do that, I speak in tongues and I pray for that woman and her husband's in the ministry. And they took me out for a meal just uh, last week in Malaysia. I said, you know, I pray for you. Hey, what would happen if, if you get, a, get a, someone's thought, start speaking in tongues and then text them? Say, you know, what would happen? You know, if this church, hey, this is a grieving crisis thing, you know, but anyway, this is the part. If this church would start being impressed by the Holy Ghost to get a thought, um, a person's name, pray for them and text them. And you'd be amazed how the Holy Ghost... I was overseas this time and I'm early hours of the morning, a businessman in New Zealand sold a block of land for me. I've only met him once and just recently and I, I got impressed and I text him and I thought he'd be asleep, you know, three hours difference. And he came back and he gave me this blooming, uh, you know, a text as, as, as big as Ben Hur type of thing and told me what happened. So don't mean to. And I was spot on. Hey, come on now. Hey, Amen. God wants to fill this house. Anyone that's saying, you can have your programs, been there, done that, uh, done everything. You know, kings of Smith, you better believe it. We've got the latest and this and that. But I want to tell you what the greatest means of evangelism is you taking care for another person. Your hands are blessed. We're going to get a miracle. You're talking about coming to the miracle. The real miracles are going to be outside this house. But the, pre the reason we don't do it, folks, is we are afraid they might say no. Okay. <laughs> That's for nothing, by the way. That's not grief. Cut your losses. Make the point, and number six, decide to move on. The power of decision. The power of decision. Once you decide, I will arise, the leper said of Samaria. We will go, a miracle happen. The power to decide, I will change, I will do this, I will do that. Now, how many know that I've got a big mountain? And how many know that this mountain shall be removed? I prophesy it. It's got to come off. But I haven't decided it will. But, you know, I haven't eat, ha, eaten meat for over a year. I've been an ex-butcher years ago. I lived by meat. I'd have three to four sausages in, in, in breakfast and a million eggs type of thing. I love a steak as big as being her. And a little over a year ago, just like that, I decided to go off meat. And, you know, I don't miss it. Don't look at me funny. I don't miss it. Because, folk, you, you, don't under, you don't underestimate the power of decision. Once you decide, I'm yet to decide with this. I travel. I say to Joan, I've got to get some weight up for it. Go on the next trip. Go to Tasmania. I said, only fish, no steak. All right. <laughs> Have faith. Have faith. I don't know if that's, is that telling me to shut up, is it? <laughs> I don't know. How many know that I'm not as respectable as Eugene? But I want to tell you this, dear friends, never underestimate the power of your faith. Have a faith system. And I've rattled through that and I understand very quickly. If you're interested, get the books. They normally go for $40.95. Today you have them at $10. $10. That book there, if you want to help people, they go out. I, you know, I don't know how many prints I've done of this now. This is written for the generic market. And this is help if you, and what we encourage people, sign your name and say, I'm thinking of you. Ten bucks to help a person. And be a link, put your name in there. And you never know what's going to happen. People, you know, I've genuinely led people through to Jesus, through grief. And there are, that's all I can say today. But I want to pray for you. Would you stand, please? And I think... It says that I'm supposed to finish at 11 a.m. Barry went for five minutes uh, uh, over that, I noticed, but that's okay. <laughs> he did a good job, Barry. 
Isn't it good to have fun in church? You know, honestly, folk, church should be a happy place. Happy place. Uh, you know what? I, I'm a bit of a larrikin. So have you been in your day too. But the point is this. I, I, got a, I got a guy in my church years ago on the coast to laugh on a tape. And uh, I was illustrating something, mimicking the Toronto thing, but we put it on, we put it on over the speakers. <laughs> Do you know, we had the best meeting all year. Just a bit of laughter. You know, maybe that's what we should do. Once a month, hey, just have laughter. Do you know there are laughter seminars? People pay. I was on the Gold Coast in a hotel doing one of these grief and crisis seminars. And I, I went, and my one was 25 bucks. I go into an ex room there in one of the hotels, and there's some, some leaflets. And it was 90 bucks, if I remember rightly, for a laughter a laughter clinic. Man, you give me 30 bucks and I'll keep you laughing all day. Amen. <laughs> oh, man. I, I do apologise. I've had to race and, and approach the subject in such a way, but I hope you've got a glimmer of help to help people. Folk, people are getting hit every day of their lives. We need to have a life link out to them. We're not going to do it by going into the now. We're going to do it by getting some knowledge, helping people, and just one step at a time, ringing them up, be acts of kindness. Amen. Anyone like to say amen to that? I must tell a story. I'm, uh, many years ago, we bought a block of land on Rabina Island, and uh, we bought it cheap. We built a house. And uh, it's, it's, well, it's gone up there now with Rabina and you know, all that sort of stuff. But there was a guy, there was a block of land beside us for quite some years. And there was this couple that sort of retired pretty early, business people. They built this mansion next to us. And it really was their God, inside, outside, you know. And, and when I have people come around, uh, they, would, they would accidentally put their tire on the nature strip. And I'd be, you know, and, and the guy would give me dark looks and go walking. I'd say, how are you going? He'd look at me. And I said, oh, is that her? I'd say, yeah, it does, you know. And I had it, someone fell in some trees and the, the sawdust went over to his side and he, it was terrible. So I said, you know, I, 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 it cost me $100 to go and get someone to clean it up, just a bit of dust, you know. Well, that's the sort of man he was. And I tell you, man, if ever I felt like I wanted to call fire down from heaven on anyone, it was him. <laughs> But anyway, I'm in my office one day and I heard laughter. I couldn't believe it. I, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And here was the wife of this grumpy old man, or well, he's not too old, next door. I couldn't believe it. And I found the story, or Joan told me. She felt impressed to go and bake a cake, knock on the bell, or ring the bell. And here's the point. We've traveled a lot, have a pool. We won't at our next house. But the point is this, you know, for years, we'd give the keys to this grumpy man who was now healed. They'd look after a house, keys to the car, look after the pool, if it needed to be drained, something happened for years. And you know why? Because one act of kindness Go bake a cake. And can I say this, folk? It's not the big things, it's the small things in life. I want you to extend your hands out to me right now. Can you do it, please? As a point of contact, Father, take these hands. Sister in the red, you've been through a bit in life. Life hasn't been easy for you been tough at times and your voice has been crowded out it's caused you some pain and hurt but I'm here to tell you today that the Lord sees, understands and he's never left you he's never going to leave you and I'm here to tell you that there's a special anointing over those hands 
and the anointing of God, you believe for it, you go after it, God's going to take the simple things and multiply it through your life. The blessing of God, the favour of God. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every person that's opened their hands today. The practical things of life. Father, I just pray, bless each person. Bless their house. Bless each wage earner. Father, that those that are struggling with teenage uh, family situations, those that have health issues, those that have financial issues, Father, whatever their issue is, I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, loose your presence. Let the power of the presence of a mighty God drive out that thing and we release a flow of your goodness, your favour, your presence over the house. In Jesus' name. Anyone like to say amen? Amen. That's the altar today, dear friends, because I've gone over time and uh, I repent for that. Amen. Honey. In the black there, you, not your head. The just shall live by faith. The Spirit of the Lord wants to take you into levels of believing. The simple becomes profound in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Fear not the face of man. Break through and allow him to take you to other levels. Amen. Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, as you've used keys in the natural, every day you use keys, keys to unlock unconsciously. I want to tell you what, there are keys that God is yet to add or to to give you realisation to your key ring in the Spirit that unlock situations in and around your life, but also externally, the best is yet to come. Did you want me to pray for you, dear? Can I share a testimony that happened to me? I went through the seven steps of that crisis thing this week. Can I just share something? Yes, yeah, sure. There's a microphone, I don't know. I'm leaving. Uh, that's it. God bless you. Be good to be with you, folks.